Apple and Google soon become two of the most important companies in health. Welcome to Tech First. Well, we know that Apple owns the most popular health tech wearable on the planet, right? And we also know that Google bought Fitbit, at least partially to compete with that. Both are investing in health, fitness, and wellness technology. About a year ago, current Apple CEO Tim Cook even said that Apple's greatest contribution to history will be in the field of health. To dive into this emerging battlefield, we're chatting with former Apple CEO John Scully, who's now CMO and Chairman of RX Events and a number of other health companies. Welcome, John. Thank you, John. Nice to be here. It's a real pleasure to have you. You are in sunny Florida, uh, Miami somewhere, I believe you mentioned, somewhere around that. Well, I'm in Palm Beach Island, which is uh, a fabulous place to be, particularly during a pandemic. Exactly. I'm near Vancouver. Uh, also a good place to be in a pandemic, but not so sunny. But uh, pleasure to have you here. Let's dive right in. And we're going to talk about Apple and Google. We're going to talk about healthcare and health tech and all that stuff in this whole session. We're going to talk about some of the debates that have been going on politically about healthcare as well. But let's start here. Uh, what's driving Apple and Google into the health space? Well, I think you've got to sort of zoom out to see the context. And the context is that in the U.S., it's a $3.6 trillion industry. I think um, it's maybe about $9 trillion if you look at a, at a global uh, number for healthcare. So it's really big. And it's an industry that has been a laggard in terms of uh, technology innovation, certainly digital uh, health technology innovation. Uh, Apple has been a standout success, certainly so far with their uh, Apple wearable, the Apple Watch. Uh, and yes, Google uh, has acquired Fitbit, though uh, there's now an effort by the uh, Justice Department to unwind that acquisition. So it's uh, still uncertain what, where the outcome is. But what I would point out is that uh, there are some really big success stories uh, which are not Apple or Google. They're, they're companies that were started as entrepreneurial businesses. For example, uh, if you take um, companies like GoodRx, uh, just went public, $19 billion uh, market cap. Uh, Amwell just went public, $9 billion current market, market cap. Uh, you have Teladoc, $19 billion market cap. Livongo, which is an online uh, coaching service for diabetes and hypertension which is high blood pressure, uh, 19 billion. So there's some incredibly big success stories, uh, yet it's an industry that is so large, John, just in the US, 3.6 trillion, that this is not a winner take all industry. Mm -hmm. and I think uh, we can have quite a conversation if you want about uh, where Apple might go and where Google might go, but uh, it's still very, very early days for both of those companies. And uh, it's very realistic to think that they'll both be uh, significant players, but it's not a winner take all industry. Very interesting. Let's dive into there and we'll come back to Apple and Google then, because as you mentioned, it's about a $4 trillion, $3.6 trillion industry in the States, close to $9 trillion globally, uh, massive. And there's been some estimates that I've seen that there's hundreds of billions of dollars of waste in the US and close to a trillion potentially globally. Uh, if we look at what's driving some of Apple and Google towards health, it, it might be some of the smart wearables and other things. We're getting more and more data, but it doesn't seem like the system has kept up with the technology. And, and it's not entirely clear which technology implement as well. It's such a complex space. How do you see it evolving? Well, let me talk about the U.S. industry because I know that best. Uh, we are not a single payer uh, system as you are in Canada, as they are in the UK and, and uh, in the EU. Uh, we are a privately run system, but often with government uh, ground rules. So for Medicare, Medicaid, for uh, the senior population is a good example of that. The Kinsey Global Institute has estimated in the US that there's $900 billion of fraud, waste, abuse, misuse, and avoidable medical costs. Now that's 900 billion out of 3.6 trillion. So it's an incredibly inefficient system is the first takeaway. Take so why is it so inefficient? Uh, one reason is that it's uh, an industry that is highly regulated at both the state level, we have 50 states, and at the federal level. And it's also an industry that spends the largest amount of money 
on lobbying. For example, the pharmaceutical industry is the single largest spender of lobbying expenses. That's $240 million a year. No one even close to that. Uh, the next biggest industry is called the healthcare industry, uh, <laughs> which is everybody but the pharmaceutical industry in, in, in health. They spend $154 million. So it's an industry where special interests, where influence has made what should be a simple system incredibly complex, incredibly bureaucratic, and therefore it's an industry that's ripe for change. The place where I think you're gonna see the high tech companies focus first is not on the sick care industry, it's on the preventative care and wellness industry. So if you look at both Apple and Google, uh, they have focused on the wellness as part of the industry. You know, why? Because sensors are getting better and better uh, with AI and, and machine learning. You know, we're able to do more uh, and more accurate things with those sensors. So that's gonna be a long runway ahead of us, I think, for a lot of innovation. For example, I'm involved with a very exciting company out of London, England, uh, which is called Zetson, and they have invented the first uh, non-invasive blood glucose monitoring system, uh, which is incredibly accurate. And it can be form factored into many different, different ways, as you're seeing lots of things from wearables to things you can just uh, finger touch uh, that could actually be part of a, of a smartphone. And <laughs> Uh, they, they also have even gone uh, further with that technology into immuno-oncology where they can uh, actually uh, use their smart patches and look through a lady's breast and do early detection of a breast cancer. And if you did it early enough, way earlier than a mammogram, uh, nobody would have to die. Wow. Uh, so there are uh, many, many things on the road ahead in terms of medical grade sensors. Remember, we're in the era of internet of things. Medical grade sensors getting better and better. Combine that with machine learning and artificial intelligence, and it's gonna really change the way we think about healthcare. I'll give you another example. In the US, uh, it's estimated that about 40% of hospital beds will be eliminated over the next four to five years. Now, the reason for that is that people used to go to the hospital, have a, uh, a surgery, let's say a procedure, and they'd be there for four or five days. Well, mm -hmm. now all surgical procedures are um, minimally invasive and you're in and out in a couple of hours. So what that means is that the hospitals have to rethink where is point of care? Is point of care just in the hospital building itself or is there an outpatient role? Is there, particularly with an aging population as, as we have here in the States, uh, more and more uh, older people are gonna be living longer uh, they're going to have high comorbidity of you know, many different diseases requiring uh, help, maybe mental uh, health, as well as uh, loneliness and things of that sort. So the ability to use medical grade sensors, whether it's something you wear, uh, something that's an ambient sensor in a, in a person's room or, or their flat, uh, all of those things are going to be integrated back into the hospital system. Now, combine that uh, with the fact that uh, while chronic care disease is the majority of the health spend in the U.S., it's, it's well over 80% of the health spend in, in the U.S., that uh, about 75% of chronic care diseases are actually reversible. Wow. So if you take something like type 2 diabetes, where uh, it's about 100 million people in the United States have uh, type 2 diabetes, and if you look at diabetes worldwide, it's you know, somewhere around 400 uh, million people growing rapidly because it's tied to obesity and it's tied to you know a, a lot of other comorbidities. Well, that's a perfect opportunity to bring in non-invasive technology like we have at Zedson to be able to give people a much simpler way of monitoring their blood glucose routinely throughout the day uh, mm -hmm. without having to go through you know patches that you have to wear that have to be calibrated every week or without having to you know use a finger you know, prick, you know, six times a day and things like that. So this uh, era of medical sensors combined with AI uh, and starting to look at it in many different form factors is really a big part of the future. And could Apple be in that? Absolutely. Could Google be into that? Yes. But but uh, don't leave Amazon out because Amazon recently introduced Halo. Yes. Halo, Halo I guess they call it. Yes. Uh, and that's a wearable. But the thing that's interesting about Halo is there's no screen. Yes. Uh, and so it's using Bluetooth to uh, be able to uh, connect with your smartphone, Android or iPhone, 
And so all the display and the stuff that takes a lot of uh, you know, battery uh, requirements can be done on the smartphone and you can have a simpler device that you wear on your wrist. And there are quite some innovative things Amazon has done with their, with their Halo device. So it isn't gonna be just Apple or Google, but it's certainly Apple and Google should be expected to be there. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, we see the battle of the tech titans in so many different areas, right? And they're they're both cooperators and frenemies in in different areas as well, where they work together. Amazon did come out with Halo. Uh, it is an interesting uh, feature. Apple, of course, has the Apple Watch, but just came out with Fitness Plus, which is, of course, you know, training and instruction and and exercise classes and uh, fitness um, instruction, all that stuff. Uh, Fitbit, of course, ha which may or may not become part of Google depending on where the antitrust stuff goes has its higher level higher order uh training as well uh and then of course there's the pelotons of the world and everything like that the question i have is that there's actually a ton of data that this device is capturing on a regular basis this is an apple watch i have a fitbit um since uh coming i believe as well there's a ton of data that, that that's generated and this one is actually the series six and so i can actually get uh, my blood oxygen here as well maybe in two years or something like that apple will do a deal and they'll be able to get my uh, glucose levels as well who knows um how can that data be fed in an intelligent way to the healthcare system in a way that doesn't overwhelm doctors, right? I mean, I, I've, I've gone to my doctor and I don't go there very often, but I've gone to him and I said, hey, you know, I've got all this. This is all oh, this too much data. I can't even look at it. I can't even think about it. Well, how can we use this, this health data, not the sick care that you were talking about, the health data that you were talking about, and, and use that to get better outcomes when we actually have to go into a hospital or a doctor? Well, first of all, uh, Apple's been very clear about the guidelines of how they're trying to build their uh, digital health business. First, they've, they've said, you know, we, Apple, are not interested in looking at this data, analyzing this data, uh, trying to draw any statistical significance from the data. Uh, they have currently about 120 high-profile uh, partners. Uh, this could be people in the U.S. like uh, Cleveland Clinic, uh, Mayo Clinic, Hospital Special Surgery, um, you know, Kaiser Permanente, large respected health organizations, but they are sending that data to them totally encrypted. And Apple also says, we're not interested in putting that data up into the cloud. Maybe someone else will, you know, one of those health uh, providers, but we, Apple, are going to keep it in the device. So the iPhone just gets more and more powerful. The storage capability gets larger and larger. And so Apple said, look, we can do so much just on our iPhone device. So whether they have a wearable like an Apple Watch or some other wearable, uh, remember they have earbuds, they have you know, uh, other people are doing rings, uh, so some are doing bands. So there are lots of different ways that you can form factor this. That Apple says, we're gonna do the processing and the encryption and the transmission from the iPhone. Now that's very different than let's say what Google is saying. Uh, Google has a number of different uh, business units inside their corporation. They have uh, Verily, which is uh, where they are doing uh, online uh, coaching for diabetes with a, a company they, they are invested in called Anduro. Uh, mm -hmm. They also uh, have uh, Google Health. Google Health is headed by David Feinberg, who was the former, um, he's been head of you know, many medical systems, uh, um, uh, Geisinger is, was the most recent one, which is uh, you know highly admired uh, medical system. And, and David has about 500 uh, people in his group at Google Health. And they're looking at population health. They're, they're looking at the fact that Google gets, David uh, Feinberg told me, 1 billion health requests uh, over just their Google search every day. One wow. billion a day. Uh, so they, they realize they're at a point of, connection with people uh, and they're you know brilliant at data analytics they're probably the smartest company in the in the world in terms of AI talent uh, so their focus will probably be how do you productize that how do you monetize that mm -hmm. uh, it's not clear yet at least not to me and I think some others as to where Google is going to do what in other words is it going to be in Google Health is it going to be in verily is it going to be in Google Cloud um, is it going to be somewhere else? So uh, I think uh, over the next year or so, uh, 
I would suspect that Google will um, have more clarity as to what their real plans are. But they certainly have huge talent and huge, huge resources. But again, I go back to the fact that uh, it's new companies, you know, con new consumer facing companies using uh, data analytics that are building incredibly valuable companies without being Google or Amazon or Apple. So uh, I wouldn't count out entrepreneurs either. Well, absolutely, especially in the current environment around antitrust uh, that we see that is preceding the election in the U.S. and probably will also follow the election there. Um, it is interesting. And the, the neat thing, I think, if you are maybe an HMO um, in, in the U.S. or if you're a national healthcare facility in Canada, the U.K., wherever else you might be, is you could build a connection into HealthKit. You could build an app that accesses HealthKit and then people can choose individually to send their data to you with some level of privacy provision or something like that, I assume. And then you could have some ongoing monitoring of, of health of citizens or members of your, your HMO or, or something like that. Do you see those being possibilities? Well, here's what I see. And, and I speak more from things that I'm actually involved with at a pretty deep level. Uh, one is automation. Mm -hmm. And uh, healthcare has lots of people moving paper around. Uh, a lot of the inefficiencies are because the systems are antiquated. You know, they're still using fax machines where most of us, you know, uh, don't even think about a fax machine when we wake up every day. And, but the healthcare industry is still, for the large part, using lots of people, call centers, fax machines, uh, you know, filling out paper forms. Every time you go to a physician in the U.S. office, whether you've been there before or you're coming for the first time, what do you do? You get a clipboard and you have to fill out forms of the same data that you filled out the last time that you came. So uh, automation is, is going to be a major part of the uh, disruption from an innovation standpoint of the healthcare industry, whether it's disrupting the current incumbents or whether it's new entrants who come in, particularly with the growth of cloud computing and start to say, boy, we can do this a better way with automation. And why do I know that's gonna happen? First of all, I'm involved with you know, one of the most successful automation companies for healthcare called RX Advance, and we're already doing that and have several billion dollars of revenue. But also I've seen what's happening in other industries like financial services. You know, it was only back in the mid 1990s, 25 years ago, that people were skeptical whether mm -hmm. online banking would ever survive. Yes. Well, then it turned into fintech, and now it is banking. You know, everything in banking is done on, online. Well, let's take healthcare. During the pandemic, uh, the telehealth industry, I'm also an early investor in a company in the U.S. called MD Live, uh, and there, uh, MD Live, there's Teladoc, there's Amwell, or the uh, big three, that uh, the pandemic uh, accelerated the adoption of telehealth. Uh, no longer is anybody skeptical that there's a future in telehealth. And it isn't just for low acuity care, John, it's for telemental health. You know, our telemental health at MD Live this year is up over 500% in growth. Why? People are stressed, they're anxious. Uh, they're dealing with mental health issues. And again, automation, we're starting to see that a lot of people would much rather uh, be able to talk regularly to a bot you know, over a uh, smartphone than they would to sit in a psychiatrist's office, you know, wondering whether the other people are wondering why they are there in that, that office sitting there with them. So uh, we're gonna see different behaviors. We're gonna see different uh, alternative ways that people can have routine uh, health. And it may be that the services side of healthcare, let's go back to Apple. Apple uh, seen its market cap double from one trillion to two trillion. Well, what changed? Well, the iPhone sales declined. So it, it can't be there. What changed was their incredible success of uh, taking their ecosystem and expanding it through services. Mm -hmm. And so Apple has had incredible growth in services. So it's very realistic to expect that Apple will continue to build their service revenue and why not build it in healthcare? But again, they're gonna have to play within their boundaries, which is they don't wanna see that data that, that doctors are gonna see. So they're gonna focus more on things that they can coach you through better lifestyle. And lifestyle can be, you know, fitness that you can do from home. Lifestyle can be, uh, you know, getting you to be more cognizant of uh, things like your weight and exercise and things like that, which fit in naturally to 
what the Apple Watch is already, already doing. Uh, I suspect that uh, Google will, will dive deeper into the actual you know, uh, treatments of health um, because they've indicated that that's an area of interest with them, you know, with with uh, Google Health and Verily. Yes. Um, Amazon is still a, a wild card to see where they're going to go. You know, they uh, uh, got into the pharmacy business uh, with with a small ac acquisition a couple of years ago um, called PillPack. And so they're now in 49 states with um, a pharmacy. They have pharmacies in their Whole Foods stores. Uh, uh, at our company, RX Advanced, we are uh, Amazon's PBM, Pharmacy Benefit Manager, uh, mm -hmm. for their employees. And um, they seem to be very happy, and we're very happy with that. But now that they've, they've gone into Halo, which looks like a, you know, a very interesting product. But Amazon has 150 million members of Amazon Prime. Yes. Uh, they launched uh, about a year and a half ago, Alexa Health. Alexa is a request and respond uh, system, really smart speakers. Mm -hmm. uh, but we all know that Google and and uh, Amazon are working on taking request and respond uh, through a, a voice um, search system to a conversational mode, which means it's got to be more intelligent, but it also means that it can do more things. So I wouldn't be surprised to see someone like Amazon uh, take their great success with Alexa's help continue to expand what it can be as your, you know, um, virtual assistant for many things in health and wellness, probably starting with preventative care and being able to expand what they're, they're doing in the pharmacy area, some online, some through their retail uh, acquisitions. So I wouldn't count Amazon out at this point, though, though they have not uh, said many things publicly of what, what their plans are. Yeah. So many things in play here. Um, I, I want to uh, sort of come to a close here and, and ask you a couple personal questions, I think. Um, uh, the first one is it's been a long time since Steve Jobs came and said, hey, uh, do you want to stop selling sugar water and start building what he called bicycles for the brain? Uh, now you're in healthcare and Apple, Google, others are moving that direction. Amazon, as you mentioned, any reflections on the arc of your career? Uh, yes, it was back in 1983. I'd been at Apple for about three months, and uh, I was having uh, a session with Steve Jobs and Bill Gates uh, pretty late at night because uh, that's when most things happened in the engineering labs in those those days in Silicon Valley. And Bill and Steve were talking about uh, how they were going to change the world one person at a time. Steve was going to do it with um, personal computers for non-technical people to do incredible you know, creative things. That became the Macintosh. Bill was doing it with uh, shrink wrap software. He invented shrink wrap software. And before Bill did that, everyone thought computers were just hardware. And they gave the software away for free. And so you had these two geniuses, and, and they both agreed on one thing, that they wanted to make a noble cause of what they were doing, of their visions. Well, that stuck with me, John, through the decades. And about 14 years ago, one of my close friends, Bob Metcalf, who invented um, the the uh, Ethernet, which is, you know, the foundational technology in the Internet, um, packet switch networks, that he said, John, you know, people like you and me, as we get older, we need to reinvent ourselves to stay relevant. <laughs> so if I thought about that, uh, I said, if I'm going to reinvent myself, I, I want to do it around a noble cause. And so I picked healthcare. I didn't know anything about healthcare. But by the way, I didn't know anything about computers when Steve Jobs recruited me to Apple to help help them learn, learn about uh, how do you market you know, a technology product the way we market consumer products. So uh, I've been uh, deep in the weeds with uh, healthcare for now 14 years. We've had a number of success com uh, successful companies that we've sold, taken public. Uh, we have several more on the track to go public over the next few months. And um, I just love what, what, what I'm doing. I don't actually run the companies anymore. Uh, I'm either a, a chairman or an active board member or uh, an active advisor to the company. The titles don't really mean that much. Uh, it's, it's you know, can I be helpful? Uh, I focus on private companies. I love to get involved when they're doing something that is truly innovative. For instance, Zedson that I mentioned earlier from, from London has really uh, invented technology that is as significant as I believe as, as MRI it was or ultrasound was. And, and they're now going through the development of productizing that in several different different areas. So uh, working with uh, in, in talented 
uh, CEOs like uh, Daniel Honeywell at, at Sesson has, has been you know, a lot of fun for me and uh, just exciting to still be part, part of the game, uh, even if I'm not the CEO. That's wonderful. That's really wonderful. John, I want to really thank you for this. This has been um, illuminating. It's also been interesting. It's been fun. It's been enjoyable. Uh, you've been a great guest. Thank you so much. Thank you for inviting me, John. It's a real pleasure. For everybody else, thank you so much for joining us along for the ride. Uh, my name is John Kutsir. This has been Tech First. You'll be able to get a full transcript of this in about a week at johnkutsir.com. Full story at Forbes will come out shortly thereafter, and the video is available on my YouTube channel. And guess what? The audio podcast comes out almost immediately. Thanks for joining. Maybe share with a friend. Until next time, this is John Kutsir with Tech First.